it is extremely commendable that certain people achieve success at a very young age and then there are many who are unable to achieve the success they want at a very young age. There is no need to be disheartened. We all have the ability to reach success. And whatever success you're looking for, you can achieve it. And this is what RAW is all about. Real, absolute wisdom. Assisting you, serving you to pass through your failures, celebrate those failures, and focus on your success, what you define as success. Welcome to RAW. My name is Rohit Basi, your host for the show. Often I've heard wise individuals say, stay strong and never give up. And this is something which we require in our relationships, in our day-to-day -day living, and in our career or our business. On the show, we have someone who focuses on this idea of stay strong and never give up. He defines it as mental toughness. I would like you to give a warm welcome to the most amazing, wonderful, outrageous individual known as Gaj. Gaj is an individual I've known who's a friend, uh, I would say more of a brother, and many times he has assisted me in getting into that state of mental toughness. So let's give him a warm welcome and welcome to RAW. Welcome to 2020 and we have an amazing, amazing guest over here with us. His name is Gaj. I won't pronounce his second name as you are aware, my audience, that I'm bad at pronouncing names. So Gaj, for the audience, your full name. Um, so Rahit, Rahuit, how do you, how do you Ro, Rohit? Rohit. Rohit, yeah. right, okay. Uh, it's, uh, you you know me for how many years and you can't pronounce my first name? <laughs> uh, since we're going to have a bit of banter today, we might as well start. Okay. Early. Happy New Year, Happy New Decade, Rohit. Uh, and thank you for having me here. It's so wonderful to be here. Hi, everyone. All the best for this decade that's coming up. Yep, it's yeah. uh, 2020 has begun and mm. now Year of the Rat. Yeah, you're Chinese the rat. New Year or in Vietnam known as Tet or Lunar New Year. Absolutely. Is that the reason you brought me here? You consider me a rat? Is that the um, not really? I just symbolism or you're no. auspicious. <laughs> 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 well, actually, my name Gaj, short yep. for Gajanun. Um, ironically, the vehicle that Ganesha, which Gajanun comes from, is a rat. Oh. So I don't know whether there's a connection. Did you like that? That was pretty good, right? That was good, that was and good. it's the Year of the Rat. Connection over there, and you're the first person to be on Raw. Absolutely, role. absolutely. It's amazing. So, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Yeah. Now, before we go into what you do currently, mm -hmm. uh, let's go back to who gadgets. Mm. Okay. Um, so, my background I was born in Sri Lanka, and uh, there's probably a really interesting story about this, which I don't think I've actually ever told anyone. Um, so this might be a little, might be interesting. Let's see how we go. Okay. Um, so my parents got married in 1977 um, in Sri Lanka, in the north of Sri Lanka, in a place called Jaffna. And one of the reasons that they moved and they decided to move out of uh, Sri Lanka into Australia was there was mm. a, a pre-civil war really taking yes. place at that time. And... One of the things that happened, and this happens a lot in collectivist cultures and mm. particularly in the subcontinent, mm. is when you get married, mm. you go and do a visit to all your family, yes. right? You go and visit them. So they were doing a, a, a train ride from Jaffna to Colombo. Okay. That is a train ride at the time. It happened twice a day. And trains would come and you would have to wait. And mm. one train would take over on the track. Another one would come through. Yes. And what happened was that they went on this train ride and... They went in the morning one. In the afternoon train that was happening yeah. at the same time, um, the train was stopped and waiting for the next train to go. Mm -hmm. And that train was actually taken over by a number of um, goons, if you like. Three women were raped on that train. Mm -hmm. And there was about four people who actually were hacked to pieces. Um, guys had come on with machetes. 
And my parents were fortunate that the timing that they took the train, that they happened to take the train on the morning hmm. ride rather than the afternoon. Hmm. If they'd taken on the ride in the afternoon, I don't know what would have happened. I probably wouldn't be here today, potentially. Destiny. And so that was happening in the midst of all this unrest that was going yeah. on. And that, along with many other things, resulted in my parents deciding a few years later they would leave Sri Lanka and they wanted to find a better home. Um, now, at the time, my dad was offered a job. He was a civil engineer. He was offered a job in Bahrain, of all places, not far from where we are shooting this today, yeah. um, to take a job. And the other option was to go and join his brother, who was living in the capital in Australia, called Canberra. Now, he had no job there. Hmm. And he decided, with a bit of uh, influence from my, my father's elder brother, to go to Australia. And it was probably one of the best decisions that he made. Mm. And he did that. He was unemployed for six months. Mm. Um, I'm sure he was probably cursing the decision at the time. <laughs> um, but we were very fortunate that we were able to live with my uncle and auntie and, and yep. my cousin at the time. And so we grew up in Australia. And we had um, you know, a pretty fortunate upbringing. And we uh, grew up there, uh, went to school, did all the things that we do in a multicultural type environment. Yep. Um, and a very fortunate uh, upbringing, sort of typical middle class mm. type of upbringing. Um, and then chose, I guess, you know, year 10, year 11, year 12 to get into psychology. Psychology, okay. Yeah, and that was kind of the path. And I think it was because of this fascination with humans. Um, okay. How we are so different and yet so similar in, in so many things that we do. Hmm. And so that started the path, okay. um, you know, for me. Uh, and so continued that uh, six years of study um, to become a registered psychologist in Australia. Uh, decided to do that. And then hmm. uh, met my wife through that process, yeah. uh, you know, going traveling from Canberra to Sydney and studying. Um, and then, you know, got married quite young. Um, uh, how young were you? Met my wife when I was 22. Um, got married a few years later, uh, yeah. and so. So you're 25 now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> terribly aged, 25 year old. Um, marriage has been good to me. You could tell yeah. I had a huge afro when I got married. <laughs> I yeah. saw a picture. Tom Cruise lookalike. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. <laughs> you still managed to maintain your looks. I haven't. So anyway, all through that time. Um, Traveled, mm. uh, so it was very fortunate. I had some amazing bosses. Uh, mm. I, mean, I was very lucky yep. uh, to have that. And uh, so worked in roles, sort of took on a national role when I was quite young, mm. relatively young, and then uh, moved to the Middle East in 2008 uh, with our firstborn, and uh, sort of came here three months before the financial crisis hit in 2008. Um, so you know, one of the topics we might talk about is resilience yep. and, and decision making. Um, and we decided to stay on. Yep. Um, and that was, again, a wonderful decision for mm. us as a family. Um, had our second child and uh, set up our business Compass um, yes. in, in 2013. Mm. Um, it really focuses on career and leadership mm. and, and performance. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we've been very uh, lucky, a lot of ups and downs. Yes. Um, and, you know, a lot of hard work, obviously, yes. has gone into, you know, building the business, as, as you know, being an yep. entrepreneur and, and all the rest of it. Um, but, uh, you know, we feel very fortunate about where we're at and, and continuing to grow and mm. continuing the roller coaster ride of an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, Currently, you've got Compass. Mm. Uh, I believe you've got a couple of partners in the organization. Yeah, work with you. business partner, yeah. Your focus from what I've worked with you on is, some define it as resilience, some mm. call it grit, mm. some call it mental toughness. Mm. What do you define it as? Mm. Um, I think a lot of these things all connect back to happiness, mm. right? And I, and I think for, for all of us, we as humans, we have a deep inbuilt desire mm. to feel happy mm. and being able to overcome obstacles mm. and challenges, mm. stresses, pressure in mm. our lives and to be able to achieve things mm. that we want to achieve, mm. I think ultimately leads us to, to be in a state of happiness. Yep. And so for us, mental toughness mm. in a lot of ways is probably the term that we would use. Yep. Um, you know, funny story, I mean, we're really getting into this deep, aren't we? Do you yep. mind if I roll up my sleeve? Please, yeah, as long know. as you don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to. Depends on your questions. Um, so, 
one of the things that came up really was uh, probably in about 2013, or end of 2012, hmm. beginning of 2013, found a book in Kinikinia, uh, the bookstore, yep. Yep. Um, which was called Developing Mental Toughness by two gentlemen called um, Peter Clough and Doug Strychek. And, you know, about two, three in the morning, I was still reading this book uh, after having picked it up that day, and I emailed the authors. And uh, within 24 hours, they responded um, saying, look, let, let's try and catch up. And I said, I was really passionate about this topic, and what could we do to kind of, um, you know, if I was to ever get into this area, what would need to happen? Mm. And uh, within a week, sitting down in front of Doug, um, who was the CEO oh, of the wow. business within called AQI. Yeah, within a week. Just very fortuitous how things happen. Yeah. Uh, you, you and I talk about fate a lot, right? And yes. I think there's an element of, of how these things happen, the energy that yes. sort of brings these things to happen. Anyway, we sat down with them and talked about it. And within sort of a year, we had created a partnership where we had started to use the products. And we used them with you know business schools, with corporate and government mm. institutions, and also with athletes, right? Sort of, mm. um, you know, professional athletes who were trying to aspire to be the best at what they could be. Mm. And looking at where were the, the elements that they were struggling with, mm. what were the parts that they could really improve in mm. terms of their performance. So that was a really powerful thing for us. And it, it provided a for us a framework mm. that we could use in all the work that we did. Mm. Um, with the ultimate goal being Rohit, that we wanted people to be happy, yeah. right? Um, and it started with us. And it started with us being business partners and co-founders of yes. companies and saying, what do I need to do to be happy? And is mental toughness linked to, to that? And we, we definitely found that the more mentally tough, the more you could demonstrate the qualities of, of mental toughness, mm. the more likely you were to be able to be able to demonstrate the elements of happiness okay. as well. Okay, interesting. Now, so I'm just going to go back into time flashback <laughs> yes so you resonate with mental toughness quite quickly from what you're saying to mm, me mm. in your younger days any scenarios or situations where you can think of where you had to get into that mental toughness mm. how long have we got today <laughs> uh, let's put it this way not that long <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know when i reflect upon my life and i, I spent a lot of time reflecting mm. um and one of the things that I've noticed is that there are lots of things that I did in my life mm. where I made decisions mm. where I didn't commit to them. I didn't commit to practices. I didn't commit to hard work. I didn't commit to doing things to the optimal capability that I had. And I think when I reflect on that now, and I think what wasted opportunities. Oh, let me give you an example. Yeah. Um, playing musical instrument. Right? There is not a day that goes by when I see a piano or a guitar and I think to myself, what a buffoon that I have been where I had the opportunity to learn a musical instrument and I was so lazy and I didn't commit to it at the time. I might have got to grade three in mm. keyboard or something, right? Mm. And, and I didn't commit, I didn't persist through the challenges or the obstacles of learning, right? Mm. Uh, and now I, I regret not being able to walk up to a piano and being able to play a beautiful tune. Interesting. Right? Now, it's not that I can't go and learn that now. And, I, and there are moments when I do go back and I have that fascination. Hmm. Um, but I think at the time, I, I really missed the opportunity. Hmm. You know, and I, I wish I knew what I knew then. If I could go back in time in the DeLorean and <laughs> go and talk to my 12-year-old self and say, you know what? Commit to tennis right? Go and see where this is going to really take you, right? Or commit to learning a musical instrument. Yeah. And yes, there's going to be tough times, mm. right? You're going to want to give it up, mm. but you're going to have to persist, mm. right? And the things that we do in our businesses, right? Yes. Um, to learn from these yes. things and to say, I'm just going to put in more effort mm. um, in the right way. Mm. You know, effort for the sake of effort is not the answer, mm. right? We know that. But effort in a way that allows you to be able to see some success or some fulfillment in something, mm. Um, is so important. Okay. Um, so, yeah, definitely there would be many opportunities where I would go back uh, okay. and kind of do that. So, um, can I ask you a, it might be a tough question, but don't, you're don't, into, don't ask it then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As you're into mental toughness, <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be quite easy for Let's you. Let's give it a go. Yeah. 
is talking about mental toughness, great resilience, which people usually talk about. Is this just a fashion or a fad or is it something which is crucial? Mm -hmm. So I, when we look at the psychology of people, you know, there are always phases, fads, you know, that come up. Uh, you know, I think when we look at things like leadership, for example, you know, we move from, you know, um, the, the men's version of leadership, you know, through to transactional leadership, through to transformational leadership. A lot of people talk about situational leadership now. So, you know, there's a lot of fads that come up. Yeah. I think the principles of, of mental toughness have stood the test of time, mm. right? I think maybe we've called it different things in the past mm. um, and we will continue to evolve and it will continue to change and I'm mm. sure the name will evolve and the name will change. Mm. But the principles have demonst been demonstrated over time. So, for example, the elements mm. of you know, being confident. Mm. Uh, we've talked about confidence since the... Um, Egyptians and, and ancient Romans, right, about believing in self mm. and how that impacts your ability yes. to be able to um, have positive uh, impact and influence on others mm. around you, right? This is not, these are not new concepts. We mm. perhaps just call them something different. Yes. Uh, when we look at uh, challenge, overcoming challenges, mm. um, you know, we've talked about those and why that's important. And virtually everyone in every profession in any relationship mm. that you have yeah, you will come across obstacles and problems. How do you deal with them? What, what is the mindset that someone needs to use mm. to be successful at something? Mm. Um, emotional control. Um, all of these things are key elements of, of this concept of mental toughness. Okay. And by, by bundling them up, I think what it allows us to do is to have just a simple framework mm. that we can use. Mm. And so there are many of these frameworks around mm. we just happen to choose one that resonated with us mm. um that, that it is the four c's if you like okay um and that for us is a very simple way of being able to go out and talk about this okay uh, very vital concept it is not something that i believe professionally is ever going to go away um it is something that might evolve in terms of how we define it and describe it mm. but the essence of resilience and mental toughness and grit is probably what has differentiated high performers from average to low performers mm. for centuries, mm. if not millennia. Okay. Yeah. So as a result of that, yeah, the quick answer to your question, and it's been a long answer, mm. um, <laughs> is this is not a fad. This is here to stay. Mm. And arguably, living in what we call a VUCA world, you know, the volatile, yeah. uncertain, complex, ambiguous, this is more important than ever before. Okay. So what are these four Cs for our audience? They are... Carrot, color, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's the diamond selection process. Um, no, that it is confidence, yep. commitment, challenge, and control. Okay. Right? And so those four elements in themselves allow us to be able to make choices. Mm. Right? And it's about the mindset that we choose mm. in each of those phases. So, for example, um, control. Mm. Control looks at life control, which is, do I believe I am the controller of my destiny? Okay. Is it up to me to drive the bus that is going to take me in the path that I want to achieve okay. success? Yeah? Or am I a passenger in this bus? Interesting analogy. You know? The other one is emotional control, which is do I choose the right emotion at the right time, at the right intensity mm. to get the outcome that I want? Mm. Yeah? And so at sometimes we might decide to display higher levels of emotion because that's what's required mm. in that context. Other times it might be that we need to dissipate or minimize mm. that level of um, mm. emotional control. Right? Mm. Now, a lot of these things are situation-based, yes. as you and I know, right? We yep. have to flex our muscles on each of those things to get the best outcome. Mm. And so that's also a very different um, sort of story and very contextually driven yep. as well. Interesting. Yeah. So the way I translate into mm. to all of this is, there's that intelligence, mm. there's that communication, and there's that emotional wisdom mm. integrating it seamlessly mm. so that you wow, can... So it stands for ICE? Yes, ICE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So integrating it so you can deal with a situation mm. or enjoy a situation, <laughs> yeah. whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, now, looking at all of this, there's so many people out there be it work, mm. be it in a relationship, being in their own business, they all want to succeed. Mm. 
So before we go in, connect the mental uh, toughness and the success together, in your world, what is success? What is your definition of success? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I think success is so different for so many people. Mm. For me, it's much more about fulfilling some sort of purpose. Okay. Right? So it's about why you do things. Yeah. Right? So whether you want to use Simon Sinek's golden circle approach yeah. or if you want to look at, um, you know, the, I guess, a deeper truth to what, what, what is in your bones, mm. right? When people talk about certain topics and you feel like there is something resonating within you, mm. something that excites you, that delights you, you know, finding out more about that can be really quite a powerful way mm. of um, getting to know more about yourself mm. and about what you want to be spending most of your time yep. doing, right? So, for example, if it's about um, solving problems, mm. right? You talk to most consultants, one of the things that they talk about is, I just really love solving problems. Yep. The good ones love doing it. And they'll do it in most contexts, in most situations, yep. but they'll do it with some sort of set, set of knowledge or skills or experiences, mm. right? So it's not just why they do it, it's also how mm. they do it, right? Um, but then it's also about what their outcomes will be. And mm. I think what a lot of people confuse success, this is my interpretation, mm. is some people will say, well, success for me is trying to make my family financially stable, mm. right? Now, for me, that's an outcome okay. of being successful. Okay. That's one of many outcomes that you mm. might have. Yeah? And so, you know, I... We talk about this with people a lot, that it's it's not about the outputs necessarily, it's about what are you passionate about in terms of the inputs, mm. right, that will allow you to achieve these outputs. Okay. And so for me, success is about these inputs. Okay. Wondering what are these inputs that you can focus on mm. every day mm. that's going to allow you to be happy mm. in what you do and to achieve feel a sense of achievement mm. um, in the way you do things. Okay. What's your... What's your sort of uh, definition of success? <laughs> Am I allowed to ask questions here? Uh, well, as you know, the interview is about gadge, so <laughs> I will have to pass that. But just to make you feel happy. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. My definition of success is what makes you happy. Mm, mm. Now, it could be something like being with your family. Mm. It could be painting. Mm. What is that that gives you you came to that word purpose. Mm, mm. And purpose necessarily doesn't mean that you have to have to you be a multimillionaire or billionaire or be famous, be a celebrity, have the greatest likes on Insta. Not, not necessary. I mean, mm. unfortunately, I see a lot of people seeing success in that domain, the materialistic. Mm. Uh, although then I've seen individuals who live a very simple life, but they are extremely successful. And you ask them, how come you're mm. successful? Mm. said, I'm just happy. Mm. Mm. It's like, they don't have any fancy cars. Yeah. In fact, some of them take the bus. Yes. So, interesting, the definition of success. Yeah. Which comes to uh, people in business, mm. people in, uh, in the relationships. Um, let's take relationships, for example. There are times in your relationships, in people's relations, I'm sure it's happened with you, it's happened with me as well, mm. where the relationship seems not as great as it you want it to be. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now, how do you translate mental toughness into such scenarios? Mm. That's a good question. I only ask good questions. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, a, there's a couple of things that come to mind, and I think I, I say it's a good question because it's a challenging question. Mm because there are multiple factors, yes. right? Um, for me, the first one is about reminding yourself that you can't control everything, right? As much as we would like to do that, and I, I, even though that disappoints me sometimes yes. because you want to feel in control, yes. there are so many factors out of our control. And a lot of cases, in the case of relationship, our partner's not really in our control, right? Our partner, you know, is their own entity, with their own vision sometimes, yes. and their own... Um, personality styles and characteristics mm. and values and so forth. And so understanding what is in our control, you know, what can we do mm. to exert a positive influence mm. on the people around us? Yep. Is it the way that I talk? Is it the kinds of questions that I ask? Is it how I am there for my partner when mm. they need me the most? Mm. Yeah? Is it about thinking through 
what is important to them. Mm. Yeah? So those things I, I sort of focus on in terms of what is in my control. Mm. The other thing is about how do I take problems that I experience and to turn them into opportunities. Okay. Yeah? So, for example, if I'm having a disagreement with my partner, you know, mm. this year happens to be the 20th year that my wife and I have, are to, have been together. Oh, wow. And so, you know, you, you take that moment to kind of reflect on things. I mean, for, for me, it's getting up to the point where that's, I've had more time with my wife than I've had with anybody else, right, in terms of intimacy and so forth. Mm. And so it's pretty much half my life. And so at that point, you think to yourself, what value do I really bring to my partner. Hmm. Yeah, and there's, I'm sure if you, if my wife was sitting here, she'd probably say, well, heck of a lot of frustration. Uh, I'm sure if you'd probably say. Right? And that probably, for me, translates to a lot of challenge, hmm. right? And, and, you know, for me, challenging myself, challenging my partner, hmm. challenging my daughters is something that I see as a way of trying to bring out the best in them. Now, how I do that is the next step, right? Okay. Because I think I'm clear on why I might be doing that. Mm. Because sometimes when you put people into discomfort, they have a higher chance of learning something. Mm. Yeah? So being comfortable with being uncomfortable is kind of a key thing for me in any relationship. Um, and I think if I'm ever getting to a point where I am getting comfortable in my relationship, I'm probably not learning a lot. In that I, I can just imagine Avi saying to you, you're too comfortable on the bed, go and sit, sleep in the balcony today. <laughs> in the <laughs> so, kennel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in the kennel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The balcony would be too kind. <laughs> <laughs> so really feel uncomfortable, <laughs> get comfortable with uncomfortable. Yeah. Be comfortable with discomfort. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the key thing, yeah. right? So I think with relationships, it's also, you know, whether it's relationships at work, you know, your personal relationships, um, feeling like you are able to challenge a little bit and to get a little bit uncomfortable I think it is really helpful. Um, it teaches probably more about myself in that case, about why I'm feeling uncomfortable, why there's discomfort, and what does that mean for me in terms of how I have relationships with people, and what do I need to be doing to get the most out of that situation mm. for myself and the people around me. Okay. So that was about mental toughness with the relationship. Mm. You've been running a business since 2013. You've worked with many top organizations, mm. many people want to be in their own business <laughs> and they see the glamour mm. behind business. Mm. But many forget they need to get tough as well. Mm. Not in the terms of being aggressive, but they need to get mentally tough. What is your recommendation? I'm not going to say advice. Mm. I'm going to say recommendation or, or guide to people who want to get into business or are in business. How do you get yourself into that mental toughness mm. state? Mm. So that was a good question. <laughs> I didn't want to say it again. I've been told off that saying that. Who uh, did say I, that? I say you? there's too many good questions happening. <laughs> so. There's probably, I mean, I'm learning every day mm. and I'm making mistakes mm. pretty much every day, mm. you know, in terms of how I do things and what I do. And I think running your own business means that you need to be pretty nimble, mm. right, when you are making mistakes and kind of having to learn from them quickly. Mm. And for me, actually, the biggest thing is realizing that I can never do anything by myself. Yeah. I need to have support. Yeah. Right. I need the right people around me. Now, mm. you and I have had many conversations walking along Jumeirah Beach, yes. right, about entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, you know, the, the good stuff about that, the fulfillment that you get, but also the challenges, yeah. right? And I think one of the key things for me is surrounding yourself with really good people. Mm. Now, by good, I mean people who are supportive, mm. but who are willing to challenge you, mm. who are willing to hold the mirror to your face, yes. right? And to have the courage to be able to stand there while you might not be happy mm. about the fact that that person is holding a mirror, yeah. that you don't like the reflection that you mm. see, right? About what happened in that particular project or the, why you didn't win that particular proposal or that bid, yep. yeah? And I think that, that for me is really important. Mm. The second thing is um, being willing to stretch myself in terms of what hard work actually meant. Mm. 
if I could have practiced 1% of the amount of hard work that I put, I'm putting into this business, yeah. into playing the piano, Oh, wow. Oh, that would have been fantastic, right? But I think at that point, maybe I needed to go through these experiences mm. to understand what it meant mm. to push myself, mm. to find new boundaries. Mm. So I think that was probably number, point number two. Mm. Point number three is this beautiful interplay between mental health and physical health. Okay. And so for me, I never really valued why it was important for your physical health to be really strong okay. and to focus on this. You know, I, I thought I was being a hero by sleeping five hours a day, <laughs> right? Wow, I'm really busy. I've constantly got things on my mind. I need to get up in the morning, you know, and, and kind of do this. And eventually, it takes a toll, right? And the more I read about the importance of sleep, the more I realize that if I don't have sleep, there's no way I'm going to be able to sustain what mm. I'm doing. It's the quality of sleep you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a beautiful article I read the other day that said, you know, as we go into deep sleep, is that REM sleep, yep. rapid eye movement sleep, and then you've got this deep sleep. If we're not sleeping for long enough, we don't actually get into this deep sleep phase. Now, what happens in deep sleep is supposedly that our subconscious mind starts to process all this stuff that we've been thinking about. Right? <gasps> now, if we don't get into deep sleep, we never get to process that properly. And so we're left with waking up sometimes feeling agitated. A lot of clutter. A lot of clutter in our heads. Mm. And I've always wondered why I felt like that sometimes. Right? And so now, trying to balance this sense of deep sleep with also this sense of you know, focusing on diet, focusing on mm. um, you know, exercise and routine mm. is sort of really important. It's the reason why the world-class athletes have a routine. There's a reason why they are the way that they are, right? Mm. Because in this world where you are completely surrounded by instability, the more stability we have in the, in the routines, the simple routines, mm. right? whether it's how we get up in the morning, the choice of clothing that mm. we have, right? Um, and I'm constantly being told off that I don't focus enough on the clothes mm. that I have. We'll have a word about that. We'll have a word around <laughs> that, I'm sure. Um, Off record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there are reasons why people like Steve Jobs used to wear the same clothes all the time, right? And it's because they did not want to waste cognitive headspace on those things because they felt that that was trivial. And they would rather use the cognitive energy on solving real problems, right? And I think you've got to decide for yourself where do you want to spend your brain power? Mm. Right? And as an entrepreneur, is it about strategizing about where my next 10 customers are mm. going to come from? Mm. Is it about who are my strategic partners going mm. to be in 2020? Mm. Right? And where do I want to spend that time and that mm. energy? Right? Which five people am I going to surround myself with this year that are going to have the biggest impact on me and my business? Mm. Right? Um, which markets? do I want to explore? Now, mm. you know, being based here in Dubai, we're very lucky that we are literally in the center of the world, yeah. right? And so being able to tap into Asia versus Europe or um, Africa or yeah. you know, other markets is, is so powerful. So, you know, the, the only limitations we have is obviously the ones we place in ourselves and therefore, who are we using around us to push ourselves out of our mm. comfort zone, our limitations mm. to grow okay. as well. Yeah. Interesting. Um, You've got two children. Mm. Mental toughness with them. <laughs> How do you groom them yeah. into mental toughness? Because a lot of the people who I deal with and a lot of the listeners, the viewers who, who tune into the show, um, many of them have kids. Yes. And a number of people I've interviewed in the past have kids. So how do you... I'm not going to use the word drill because to me that comes as very domineering, mm, but mm. I would rather use the word groom mm. your kids about mental toughness. We groom them on the outside, but what yeah. about the inside? Yeah. So, I mean, look, I beat them a lot. Oh. <laughs> so, okay. He did not mean that. <laughs> I know he's not that. He's, he's, no, he's we... putty in their hands. <laughs> look, I have two beautiful daughters yeah. and... Um, no, they run rings around, yeah. hubby, my wife and I. And I think one of the key things is that, you know, when we think about setting ourselves up and our children up 
to be able to deal with the challenges that they face. Mm. It is really about how they think. You know, what are the words that they are saying to themselves? Right? Uh, okay. And there's this beautiful cycle that runs our life, right? It's, it's the cognitive cycle, which is that our thoughts affect our feelings mm. and our feelings affect our behavior. Right? Okay. So the one thing that I try and do, and my wife and I try and do, is if we look at the behavior, we work backwards. And see. So you've just gone and had an argument with your sister, right? What were you feeling at that point? Now, what made you do that, right? Mm. What were you saying to yourself at that point that made you have those feelings that then made you behave in this way? Mm. Now, I think with children, it's a lot about repetition, Hmm. It's having that constant conversation hmm. with them because it's not that they're going to be able to pick it up immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. And so at the moment, we've probably had a thousand conversations <laughs> trying to repeat this in different ways, hmm. right? But we have a belief that at some point it starts to, to seep in and we've seen it. You know, hmm. the way that they sometimes interact with their cousins or whether hmm. they might talk to their uncles and aunties or their grandparents or the, or the way that they might reflect um, after a discussion mm. and they see that perhaps they weren't kind. Yeah? Okay. They weren't compassionate in mm. the words of Mr. Rohit Bassi, right? <laughs> what were they not doing to have that empathy mm. with people around them? Mm. And so for me, repetition of a consistent message mm. is the first thing okay. that needs to happen. The second thing I think with kids is putting them into situations where they can experience where they need to be resilient, where they need to show grit firsthand. Mm. So my wife and I, we, we were fortunate enough that we took the kids to Samoa um, mm. you know, a couple of years ago. And on that trip, we stayed with a local family, we ate the local food, we had cold showers, we, oh, wow. we lived a local life. Right? And part of that was to demonstrate to them about what it meant for others to live in a world where perhaps they didn't take for granted. The, the luxuries that they might have had, right? So that was also about building a sense of resilience or even compassion or empathy, mm. or empathic understanding for the mm. people around them, right? So I think that was another thing is to actually experience mm. it, right? So in addition to the first two points, probably the third one is around having very open dialogue and conversations mm. about that. Okay. And that means also with peers, but with also other people. And I think that sometimes parents, we, we, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be able to solve all the problems for our kids. Yeah. And sometimes you've got this entire infrastructure or support that's around you that can also help you to do that. So drawing on teachers, friends, family, um, other siblings, hmm. um, cousins in particular who are slightly older who might yeah. have experienced things can be a wonderful way of also getting a message across mm. um, to our kids as well. Mm. So we try and draw upon all those resources, okay. um, you know, to do that. Sometimes they're epic fails, right? <laughs> and that's going to happen, right? Yep. But what do we do with an epic fail? You learn from it, yep. right? You try perhaps a different technique mm. that's going to work. And I think this is where sometimes there's a lot of frustrations as a parent that you read books that sort of cater to the vast majority of people and but this, as you and I know, there's a big difference between theory and application. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that the more that you play around with things and you practice it, you absorb it for yourself, you, and to do that, you have to understand the content and apply and use your style to be genuine hmm. and authentic in how you deliver a message hmm. to your child, but to do it consistently. Um, and I think probably one of the biggest things is, is being able to have that message very clear in your mind. Hmm. And as soon as you see something that does not align to those values or that message, to stop it immediately mm. okay. rather than letting it go forward. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it, it yeah. does make sense. Because mm. um, one of the things which I, when I'm speaking to my friends or even if I'm talking to one of my clients and if they have children, the, ch the, ch the child topic comes up mm. and there's always this comparing what, the current generation is doing to the pre from the previous generation mm. and we as a generation forget we used to compare ourselves to the previous generation yeah, yeah. so it's a re repetition you know which we're like saying we used to say we're not going to do it yeah the way they did it but we're saying the same words absolutely which the previous generation is saying and that's why that mental toughness mm. first applying it to ourselves 
is very crucial because yes. when the kids see it, they lead by example. Absolutely. You know, you lead, it's by leading by example, and that's mm. what you're showing over there. So you mentioned fail, mm. failure. Mm. Um, from your own life, <laughs> where you had you define it being as a failure, and how did mental toughness assist you? Mm. Um, again, how long have we got? <laughs> There's going to be lots and lots of stories. So let's talk about from a business perspective. Mm. There's one in particular that kind of shaped, I think, how I looked at mm. our business um, and also how it was important for us to look at things slightly differently. Yeah. Um, it was four months into starting our business and I was driving back from Abu Dhabi mm. and we had been involved in a tendering process mm. To win a piece of work it was an 18-month project with one of the Abu Dhabi uh, government entities. Mm. And we'd gone from, I think, 14 suppliers down to the last two. And it was a Thursday afternoon, evening, and I was driving back to Dubai. And I, the call came through from the client, a client I'd known for many years, lovely guy. And it was the HR director. And he said, Gudge, I hope you're going well. Weekend's here. Just wanted to let you know that we've made a decision and if it was up to me and my heart sank because obviously oh, yes. at that moment you know there's going to be bad news mm -hmm. is coming um, we would have chosen you right to be the provider however there was one particular box that we couldn't tick and so as a result of that we're going to have to give it to the other provider now that particular box was do you have international experience as a company as a company now, as individuals we had, but of course, as a company, we were quite young. We'd only been working in the UAE, you know, for that first four months. So we lost that mm. project. That would have kick-started our company beautifully. I was so angry. And that was the first major failure in our business. And we lost this. Just because tender. that one tick. One tick. And I remember, and I can't remember how I got home on the way from Abu Dhabi to Dubai. I was in such a rage. What I do remember doing, and this is where the mental toughness kicked in, was I remember calling our business partners and mm. saying, we need to talk about this today. Let's catch up and we need to work out how do we make sure that we never get into this situation ever again. And we ended up catching up that night and we came up with a plan of which companies we needed to work with internationally so that we would never be asked again whether we had proper international experience. And as a result of that conversation, there were probably four or five companies that we came up with. We were working with four out of that four or out of that five companies, mm. right? There's only one company that there's not been ticked off yet. We've tended for them, we haven't won anything. Mm. And as a result of that, it has opened up many doors okay. for us. So out of that failure, one of the areas around Mental toughness is challenge, overcoming challenges, mm. turning a problem into an opportunity. Right? Mm. So that was one example of how we had to turn that around very quickly. Mm. Yeah? Um, when it comes to relationships, mm. it's a really fascinating one. Yeah. Right? And I always remember this topic of self-love. I see self-love come everywhere. up. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Right? And I, there's this quote that comes up to me, and I, I always sit there pondering it. Now, yeah. I think I'm going to do a a post about it at some point in the future, which was basically like tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> tonight actually. You have to love yourself before you can love other people. Okay, I'm sealing that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the quote that I like. In fact, in fact, I don't think that's actually a very helpful quote. Mm. And I'll tell you why. Mm. This is my take mm -hmm. on this, right? And of course, it's neither right or wrong. Mm. But Gaj is always right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Abi, my wife, if you're listening to He's this, always right. Rohit said that. Yeah, Not he's me. always right. Yeah. Um, the, I think you can learn to love yourself through helping other people. Very yeah. beautifully said. I don't think you have to wait till you have loved yourself enough to get to a point where then you can then love other people. Mm. Right? And so when I hear people say, you have to fix yourself first or you have to love yourself first, and then you can help other people. I, I'm not fully bought into that. I don't know what you think about that. Well, that's a very, it's mm. interesting. A couple of weeks ago, mm. one of my friends uh, who I, you know him, 
mm. Muhammad Oes. Mm. He's a good guy, yeah. man. Yeah. We were having the same discussion over the phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. And we came to the same conclusion. You can mm. still help someone. Mm. And through that help, the love within you starts mm. evolving. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. So I think that is also an element of understanding that you also can give to receive. And sometimes you need to give first yeah. to receive. And I think there are a lot of people out there right now who are waiting to receive first. Mm. Um, and understand that you might need to give. And so if it's just about self-love, you know, th there's so many podcasts out at the moment talking about you've got to start with yourself. You've, it's got to be about you. If you're not in the right place, it's never gonna, you're never going to be able to help out everyone else. And I think there is no definitive answer around this. And I think if we get to a point where we start seeing this as black and white, that we see that that is a right and there is a wrong, I think we've missed the evolution of humans, right? There, there, there is no right or wrong. The compassion is missing. The now. compassion is missing, right? Where does compassion fit in all this? Yeah. Right? It's crucial, right? If we drive with compassion first, maybe we can do a bit of both. Yeah. Maybe we can actually heal ourselves and, and love ourselves through that. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting you say, so I'm listening to you. And the word which you use is mental toughness. Mm. But what I'm hear, hearing is, is a lot of emotions mm. concerning mental toughness. Because mm. mm. this is how I envisage mental toughness. It's all about here. Mm. But what you're really saying to me from what you've told me is, is a connection of the heart mm. Mm. and the brain. Yes. It's working in sync, working together. Absolutely. That's what I'm understanding with your way of looking at mental toughness. I think there's a new book for you on this. I'm sure you could, that's going to be your next book. <laughs> uh, will you write, with, write it with me? Sure. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do it. But I think you're right. I think there's an element of, you know, we, we do need to combine those things. It's very easy to rationalize everything. Yes. Right? Uh, so what is the place now in our society for having a sense of heart? Hmm. And what role does heart play hmm. in our relationships, in our businesses? I mean, do we actually genuinely care for our customers? Right? How do we show compassion to our customers? Yeah. Right? What do we do? There was a social media uh, manager a few years ago who used to say, you have to imagine running a business is like a boxing match. Right? You have to give, give, take. Pa give, jab, give, jab, give. hook. Mm. Right? Mm. And if you give a couple of times, at some point you might ask, to get something, right? But you've already given. Mm. So you're in a position where you're not necessarily void of having helped people or supported people. Mm. So you, you're coming from a, a position of strength mm. in lots of ways as well. Mm. But you need to give sometimes before you take. Mm. And so there's an element of finding that healthy balance, mm. right? Um, I think there are some generations out there at the moment that there seem to be a lot more about taking mm. than it is about giving. Mm. I think we're losing this a little bit, and that mm. concerns me. Um, so I think if we go back to the companies that we work in, the businesses yes. that we're in, you know, what are we doing to kind of show that compassion or combining the head and the heart Absolutely. to kind of get the best outcomes, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to come close uh, to the close of the interview. So mm. a couple of more questions for you. Mm. Um, for the people out there, this could be... Uh, in a relationship, running the business, career, maybe looking for a new job, lost a job, or lost, confused. What is that one thing they could do for themselves which will allow them to increase or just move their mental toughness a bit higher than mm. what it is now? Mm. Mm. It's probably a few things. Mm. One of my favorite quotes that kind of gets me out of a tough spot sometimes when mm. I'm feeling down is controlling the controllables. Okay. It's about reminding myself what is actually in my control. Okay. There are a lot of things out of our control. You know, and most things are out of our control. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now, you know, part of our business looks at helping people going through redundancies. Yes. Yeah. And at that point, people feel pretty down. 
Yeah, it's probably well, arguably. That's why I call you George Clooney. That's yeah. <laughs> up in the air. Up yes. in the air, yes. George Clooney. Yeah, so I've given him lots of pointers about you know beard structure and all sorts of things. <laughs> no, so George in that movie, you know, it was about very much him going out and helping organisations to fire people. You yeah. know, to have that uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of people out there very worried about their jobs, about their job security. Yeah. And there are a lot of things tied to their job, you know, whether it be mortgages, the education for their mm. kids and livelihood and so forth. And one of the things I think for people to remember is if you think about what's in your control, you think about how I turn up to work. Mm. How do I need to focus? What do I need to focus on today? What is one thing that I can do today that's going to shift me into a more positive state? Mm. Right? Is it as simply as getting up in the morning and going for a walk mm. for 30 minutes? Yeah, to get the adrenaline mm. um, going, right? Is it setting little micro goals, mm. right? So that step by step, it could be as simple as making the bed in the morning. It could be as simple as um, going and helping somebody mm. that you, a neighbor or mm. someone at work, right? Um, so there's, there's going to be little micro steps that you can take, but asking yourself, what's in my control, mm. I find to be quite helpful. Right? And reminding yourself that you can't control everything. You can't mm. control the economy of the country. You can't control what the leadership is going to do in our business, right, necessarily. Can't control your wife. Can't control your wife. She can control you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> yeah, you are joking. Yes, I am joking. <laughs> so <laughs> one of the key things is then thinking through how do we remind ourselves of mm. that on a regular basis and even just setting up a routine. Mm. to say, what is in my control? What mm. can I be focusing on? And therefore, what are the one or two things that I can get out of today that's going to be helpful? Okay. Right? So that would be number one. Mm. The second thing is making sure that you are surrounded by good people. Right? And that is not a, uh, a simple task. I think you know, it is becoming more and more challenging for people. And mm. you ask them, how many people do you really trust that are your core group? Mm. That number from 20, 30 years ago has shrunk to perhaps three or four people now, mm. right? So knowing who those people are that you can go to during good times and bad, mm. yeah, who you can draw on yeah, for energy, mm. um, just to kind of talk through mm. issues, right? Um, but at the same time, remembering to celebrate the achievements, with mm. them as well, right? And having the good times with them mm. um, is also really important. So mm. surrounding yourself with those people, I think, is the is the second thing mm. um, that you could do. Yep. Um, and I think the third thing, you know, I, I sometimes when I'm facing a big problem, mm. uh, I ask myself the question: How do you eat an elephant? <laughs> I'm vegetarian. Um, vegetarian. <laughs> it's a bit of a problem. Um, one piece at a time. Yep. So when a big when a problem looks too big, right? Reminding ourselves, what is the piece that I can take right now? Right? What can I start with? Mm. That's going to be digestible, right? For you, it's going to be the toenail because you're a vegetarian. You're not going to be able to eat anything else. <laughs> but what is the piece that yeah. is actually going to be relevant, mm. right? And I think that is probably the third thing for me is get things to bite-sized mm. pieces so that it's not overwhelming. Mm. Because sometimes it does feel that way, mm. right? So we need to learn how to bring that back, mm. you know, to basics as well. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to close the interview now, mm. and I'm going to ask you a last question. Mm. What is your take on having gratitude? Mm. My take on having gratitude. I think it's such an important element of reflection, and it does put life into perspective, right? When you're able to think about how lucky we are in so many ways about the things that we have around us. Mm. And whether you live in a slum in Mumbai mm. or you are able to be able to provide well for your family and to have options and choices to be able to do the things that you do, mm. just being grateful for the things that you do have in your life Mm. plays such an important role in your psyche mm. right? and the decisions that you make in such a positive way mm. in your life. So my take on gratitude is that I think we'd live in such an amazing place mm. if we took a couple of minutes a day mm. each to reflect on that. 
each day. And I know you can get these gratitude journals yes. and you can do, do those kind of activities. But I, I, it is absolutely vital. We do this with our kids. We ask them after school sometimes. Um, what were you grateful for today? Right? Usually it's something like a chocolate muffin or a, whatever it is. Right? But reminding themselves that they actually did have some good stuff hmm. that took place today. Hmm. Amongst the challenges and, and various things that they had to go through. Hmm. What is your take on gratitude? For me, it's a very powerful source of energy. Mm. We've had this discussion about gratitude in the past. Mm. Although this interview is not about me, but I'm still going to answer the question. <laughs> um, if you recall last year, we were walking on the beach and I was just venting it all out. Mm. Mm. And we started talking about gratitude. Mm. And amongst other things and how I started calming down. Mm. So I see it as a, a powerful, I'm not going to call it a tool, it's an energy source mm. to lift yourself up. Because mm. from my experience of my life, this is my truth. Mm. Every time I've been in a tough situation or a painful situation, I have actually forgotten to be grateful about things around me mm. to the smallest of all things, mm. such as I can breathe, such as I've got fresh water, mm. such as I've got two legs I can still walk, mm. Mm. Yeah, such as I've got a car I can still go drive. Yeah, it might not be a fancy car, but I can still use it. Absolutely. So it's the smallest things. Mm. And then what I start seeing, the problem which is happening in front of me or the pain which is go I'm going through, I see it minimizing to a point it also disappears. Mm. So that's mm. the power of gratitude for me. Mm. That's amazing. Thank you. I mean, that's what I, one, of the things, one of the many things I love about you, Roy, is the ability for you to bring so much of yourself, right, to that, to the story, to, to, to the discussions. And I think that sense of sincerity and being authentic and genuine is such a powerful thing. I place it just as high as gratitude, right? For more information about our guests, our services, please feel free to connect with us on our website, www.roitalks.com or email me at roi at roitalks.com Have a wonderful, wonderful life. Thank you, thank you, thank you.